Hello. Hey, Shish, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm fine. Thanks, John. Okay. Uh, let's see who's here now. Adesh is here. Yeah. Change his background. No, I just blurred it. Oh, okay. Can I just uh, check my uh, screen share? Yeah, sure. Yeah. The researcher from Iran was here, uh, um, Hashish. Pardon? Sorry? The, the researcher, the, 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 the doctor that's doing research in MIS surgery. He, he yeah. was here. He was here. Oh, okay. But you'll meet him later. He, he wants to present maybe the next time. Oh, okay. That would be great. Okay. So, okay. Uh, can we, can you see okay. my screen? Yeah, I can see it. You want to play the video or something? Yeah, I'll just check it. Okay. It's not, that's not full screen. You got to put, you know how to put it full screen? There you go.
And that's Is a video. Okay? Yeah, that's that's fine. There's no sound, right? Uh, there is sound, uh, not in this, but some other videos. Okay, because when you share the screen, you have to turn the option of play sound. Okay, and... And we'll go over that before you... you do you have any talking videos today? Uh, yeah, I have one video in which I have to play a sound. Okay, then let's go over. Get out, get off the screen share right now. Okay. Okay, start it again. The first screen you see, there'll be an option to play sound at the bottom. Now click on the screen share. The first screen you see, do you see yeah, it? It's bottom? clicked on. Okay, put it, put the sound on. Okay. Okay. And, I, I, go I ahead and put your video on. Let's let's test it. Put your video on. Sure. Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah, I can hear it, but I don't know if the sound does it. I mean, yeah, that, sound... that, that's the sound. It's the muffled sound. It's the it's sound of a drill, right? Yeah, the neurosurgeons muffled... can make <laughs> the neurosurgeons can make sense of it, John. <laughs> but sometimes the sound's important, but I don't think a drill sound is. Uh, okay, we, we're lacking a speaker, right? Do you want? Um, do we have a speaker here yet, uh, Ashish? Uh, Doctor Dubey, uh, what I can do is I can maybe call him up. Okay, uh, I'll just call him. Is he the first speaker? Yep. Yes. Oh, okay. No, we're not rigid with the times. Hang Vietnamese. <coughs> Greetings, Hung. Can you hear me, Han? I can hear you. Okay, there's a Vietnamese neurosurgeon. She... Uh, uh, Hello, I'm Han. sorry, Hi. he's not uh, uh, John and Adesh. I think he's yeah. not uh, attending the phone right now. Okay, we'll begin with your talk then, if you want. Yeah, just yeah, like yeah. I'm absolutely ready. Oh, well, okay. So you want to start? Uh, yeah. Okay, then I'll in I'll just introduce you, Ashish. And you take it take it away. Oh, no, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Uh, you're going to moderate, right? No. Yeah. Yeah. Adesh can moderate. Let me get the hold on. Let me get the... I'll share. I uh, would like to share this screen. If you can see, is it visible to everyone? Your name, Abesh. I'm trying to get your name here. Yeah, I see it. I see it. Subhir sub Dubey. I'm sorry, Adesh, I couldn't send you mine. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. No, no, no. I have yours as well. Just to second. Okay, okay. I'll okay. share. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I had sent one. Ah. Can you Adesh, see Adesh, where, where are you working at, Adesh? I think we should go ahead with the first talk till Dr. Sudhir is not there. Yeah, sure. That's a good idea. Adesh, uh, you practice where? I practice in uh, near uh, around 300 kilometers, maybe 250 miles away from where Dr. Ashish is practicing. So I what, am, what city? What's, this, what's the city? It's called Bhopal. B-H-O-P-A-L. Oh. oh, Bhopal, where, where the nuclear the reactor was. Well, the big no, no, accident. No, no. It, it was the uh, Union Carbide uh, MIC leak, not the nuclear reactor, but uh, the cyanide leak, methyl isocyanate. Well, I'm just going to say Indian. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that covers a lot of territory. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to take you off the screen share there, okay? 
Because yeah. I want people to see Adesh, uh, Ashish's face first. Okay, let me get you off the screen share, okay? Okay, you guys ready to start? Adesh. Okay, here we go. Here we go, uh, Ashish. You ready? 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3. Good morning. This is Dr. John Bennett uh, broadcasting from Miami Beach, home of uh, Neurosurgical TV. We have uh, Another episode of the MIS surgery. Uh, every two weeks we're having this. Uh, and today we're going to have a, a couple of lectures. But let me first introduce the moderator, Adesh Srivatava, a neurosurgeon from India. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, John. So, uh, so today we are going to have a couple of talks. Uh, one would be on uh, a cranial case and the other would be spine as we always try to do it. Uh, to begin with, for our first talk, uh, we have uh, Dr. Ashish Tandon. Uh, Dr. Tandon is an AIMS India alumni. AIMS, it's a very uh, famous institute the world over. He has a vast experience. He has worked with the likes of giants like uh, Professor Fred Gentili, Professor Charles Steele. He also did his spine fellowship uh, from uh, University of Munich in uh, Germany. Currently, he is the lead consultant at Minimally Invasive Brain and Spine Center, uh, which runs uh, even runs a fellowship program back uh, here in India in the city called Jabalpur. He is the chief uh, neurosurgeon for the Center for Minimally Invasive Neurosurgery. Uh, it's a division of the Aditya Super Speciality uh, Hospital Group, uh, Jabalpur, since uh, 2007. Uh, other than his clinical practice, Dr. Ashish Tandon is a very good speaker. He's an academician and has published many uh, research papers and uh, uh, a couple of book chapters as well. So without wasting any further time, um, I would request Dr. Ashish to uh, begin his talk and uh, he will be sharing his experience on the management of giant uh, pituitary uh, adenomas uh, uh, the technical consid uh, considerations uh, through the endo, uh, nasal endoscopic approach. Over to you, uh, Dr. Ashish. Dr. Ashish, we cannot hear you. I think you need to unmute yourself. Ashish, are you unmuted? Yeah, now is it okay? Yeah. Great. Uh, so as I was uh, saying, uh, I'm uh, extremely thankful to John and Adesh. Uh, Adesh for your words and John for his uh, continuing uh, uh, endeavor with uh, Neurosurgical TV. Uh, today, uh, I would be deliberating on uh, endoscopic endonasal excision of giant and uh, large pituitary tumors. So it would be a mixture of two. And uh, I would take you through step-by-step -step, uh, sort of journey of how to uh, go about ta tackling these large tumors. Sorry. Uh, so, uh, this, uh, as you can appreciate, this is a large tumor uh, and it, is, it has a variegated sort of a picture, uh, heterogeneous, but almost reaching to the third ventricle and uh, even pushing the third ventricle uh, uh, into uh, so, uh, sort of superiorly. It has uh, uh, eroded the cella and it is almost lying into the sphenoid sinus completely. Uh, it has also, in fact, eroded the posterior aspect of uh, the clivus. 
So uh, in such cases, uh, like again, if you look at the coronal picture, just, just a different dimension where you can see front on uh, a large tumor pressing the third ventricle, pushing it up, obviously has a lot of visual issues. Uh, on axial images, uh, extensive uh, movement paracellularly, and uh, it has almost eroded the complete clivus in this region uh, and uh, reaching up to the uh, bacillar and uh, the prepontine systems. So uh, a really big challenge for uh, the surgeon, what uh, we did was a complete endonasal excision. And uh, this was again, purely uh, through the endoscope. And as I go through the lecture, I would uh, present what the world literature is and what my practice is as far as tackling such large tumors. This is another uh, view of the same case where a uh, post-op uh, coronal was undertaken. And this is the SAG view uh, demonstrating a complete excision. Now, before I go on to the topic per se, we know that uh, the pituitary adenomas are classified in various fashions, uh, depending one on the size, when it is say less than 10 mm, it's micro, more than 10 millimeters, we term it as macro adenoma, up to almost 40 and 40 or more would be giant. But then that is just a very basic or a very simplistic uh, form of uh, classification. And so you have other classification as well, like the NOPS grading, where depending on what is the relation of the tumor to the internal carotid arteries, you divide from grade zero to grade four. Uh, NOPS was one of the most initial sort of uh, grading system for the pituitary tumors. And then we have uh, the Hardy's classification wherein depending on the location of the tumor within the cella and then paracellar or supracellar location. So uh, in my practice, uh, I would sort of assimilate all the three classifications. I would look for the uh, cella, uh, the erosion of the cella, how much of it is into the sphenoid sinus, what is the supracellar extension. So uh, sort of uh, uh, part of it is the Hardy classification. I would consider the size, but you know, size does not matter. For me, anything which is two, three, four, five centimeters, all are large tumors. Uh, so it doesn't matter to me whether I classify it as giant or large, but they are really big tumors. So, and they present sort of a little similar type of challenges. So for me, size alone is, is not a major factor in my decision making. So Hardy's helps me, but NOPS again helps me a lot because that helped me plan uh, regarding where all I need to focus while I'm excising the tumor. Do I need to stay just medial to the carotids or at times I may need to look a little more externally or laterally to the carotids? How much of it is gone below? How much of it has gone towards the clival carotids? And so on. So uh, the uh, sum and substance here is that uh, try to assimilate all types of grading system and that would help you plan your surgery in a much better uh, fashion. So uh, again, to uh, resonate the, uh, uh, the idea or the philosophy of uh, many of the great surgeons, uh, who have been practicing endonasal endoscopic uh, pituitaries that uh, uh, pre-op study of the radiology and planning would obviously be the most crucial as far as dealing with these large or giant tumors is concerned. And so you can uh, include all the sort of classification. 
Now, uh, what I have done is I have divided this, uh, this broad topic into two uh, areas where uh, one would be, uh, I'm sorry, how do I do this? So in part one, I would be talking about lumber drainage, the positioning, the technique that I use, uh, like two surgeon forehand, wide cellar opening Doppler. This would be like, I would be focusing on this part today. Perhaps in the next lecture, I would be talking on the technique of how I open the dura because that itself I feel is very important. The technique of starting and ending the dura decompression what are the types of scopes and instruments that one requires to deal with such large tumors? And then finally, reconstruction or dealing with certain complications. So uh, this is how I have divided the lecture today. Uh, but before uh, I start uh, uh, talking about uh, what all I would be advising, uh, I'll just share with you one video. Uh, I hope this plays. Yeah. So this is an endoscopic transnasal excision of a, again, a large tumor. If you look here, it has eroded the sphenoid, the cella and entered into the sphenoid large extension, but I do not think so. It has uh, uh, gone totally around the carotids here. After opening the cell, uh, the sphenoid, drilling the clivus, following that, I do a wide opening of the cella. So the cella is exposed from anterior intercavernous sinus to the posterior intercavernous sinus. So the clivus and the lower part of the clivus, or rather upper part, of the clivus needs to be totally uh, well seen, exposed here. I'm using the Doppler. I'm a very big fan and proponent of using the Doppler. So I'm using the Doppler to study the extent of exposure from side to side. Uh, this is how I'm opening the dura. I would be uh, talking about this uh, in quite a detail uh, as we go about uh, in this lecture series. And then once the dura is uh, open, uh, just coagulate the sleeves, let the dura sort of separate in the lower part uh, towards the clival part and not, not touching the superior and suprolateral part. So all the activity here is, is focused towards the clival part. So here, if you will appreciate, it is more towards the clival part and uh, towards the uh, uh, sort of postro or infrolateral. Till now, all the surgery is being performed through the zero degree scope. At one point of time, once I have finished the clival decompression, I would be shifting to more angled scopes to look superiorly. Uh, so here again, uh, I uh, like to complete the job as much as possible till I start looking. Now, if you look here, there are parts of the pituitary, normal pituitary you start uh, uh, finding in there. It is only at that point that, you know, I stop, I stop uh, sucking or scraping. After that, we move towards superior and suprolateral. Again, lateral is the first area. And as the tumor starts getting decompressed, uh, you see the diaphragma sort of starting to fall. And that is what is happening here. And then because I have, it's a two surgeon uh, forehand technique, I'm, I'm getting a good view and I'm using my uh, suction to sort of push the diaphragma superiorly and you know, scraping or sucking the tumor from below. <clears throat> there is a chopstick technique, which is single nostril, one surgeon, which is also being propagated. However, I personally am more happy and satisfied and uh, sort of am able to get 
good result. Here, finally, uh, a complete excision uh, was achieved. The diaphragm was falling down. Uh, luckily, uh, uh, there, there was no major tumor left on the side. We found some leak here. This was towards the uh, optical, medial optical carotid recess. And so we just put a small uh, issue there, glue, and uh, we uh, reinforced it with some more uh, tissue, glue, and finally the reconstruction was complete. So uh, basically, this was to share uh, the the broader technique i i'll be showing you a couple of more videos perhaps in the next part of the series uh, so that uh, you uh, you get a little more hang of uh, how uh, or what i or do um, and post operatively we were fairly happy the visual symptoms uh, started recovering pretty fast we had an excellent post-op uh, excision in this case. As you can see, we've gone right to the clivus. The clivus is all gone in the upper part. And this is the coronal uh, picture. So uh, now uh, I would be discussing on the technique. So what I, up till now, what I have done is I have talked about the, uh, that, uh, the type of classification, we need to consider all of them. I just shared a couple of big cases to just uh, provide confidence to the youngsters or those who are just getting into endoscopic endonasal uh, that you can promote yourself towards, you know, attempting bigger ones as well. And now, uh, after having demonstrated one video, I would be talking on these topics. This would be the part one of the technique where I will share my thoughts and I would share the literature as well so that you can take an unbiased uh, decision on yourself what suits you in your practice. So one is lumbar drainage preoperatively, how to position the patient, two surgeon forehand technique versus a single nostril, single surgeon technique, or two surgeon single nostril, or various combinations, a wide cellar opening, and how to sort of uh, avoid vascular injuries, or how to avoid complications, and the use of Doppler. Uh, so I would be talking on these today. So let's start with lumbar drainage for giant pitads. So look at this uh, article. It's, uh, it's a huge art, I mean, uh, uh, article with a huge number of cases which is published in World Neurosurgery. And it uh, is about uh, endoscopic endonasal approach for giant pituitaries occupying the entire third ventricle. And here he says that extended endonasal endoscopic approach are safe, efficient, single stage, but pre-op CSF fluid diversion may be used to manage associated hydrocephalus in these cases. However, they were not very, uh, they were not very pragmatic and uh, authoritative. Then uh, this is another uh, paper which was published uh, showing randomized uh, control trial to determine the role of intraop lumbar uh, CSF drainage in patients with endoscopic transphenoidal. And the conclusion was it does reduce the in incidence of intraoperative CSF leak. <coughs> uh, okay, now this is a, a paper, I, I, I think, uh, this is another paper which sort of uh, opposes the requirement of lumbar drainage, and it is uh, from uh, none other than Edward Laws himself, the role of lumbar drain. And he categorically says that lumbar drainage was not helpful in achieving cross-total resection. 
Also, statistically, there is no major significant advantage in prevention or treatment of intraop CSF leak. So, uh, you know, the jury is still out. There are, uh, you know, uh, uh, in favor and against of lumber drainage. As far as I am concerned, I do put in a lumber drainage for these giant tumors. And uh, I have found uh, in my uh, limited experience that not only the CSF leak rates are lower, however, the excision also is much more controlled. But then there is a, a system to this madness and you need to sort of control the amount of lumber drainage and after the surgery, you need to refill through the saline or air as well. And I would uh, uh, push you all to go through uh, papers, more papers on the use of lumber drainage in uh, giant pituitaries. Now, uh, coming to uh, the two versus four handed technique, uh, I am uh, again a very big proponent of uh, the two surgeon four hand technique. And if you see uh, in this paper, uh, again, there is a clear advantage of forehand technique over two hand with better clearance of uh, the tumor with minimal morbidity. Now the controversy between single nostril versus two nostril is the amount uh, or the percent of local complications. It makes sense that if you're using just one nostril vis-a-vis -vis two, perhaps the erosion, the intrusion by the surgeons would be less. There's no doubt. But is it making significant difference to the patient? There are papers, again, for and against. We have been using it uh, for last 15 years. And we do not find patients to be complaining time and again just because of nasal complaints. There is nasal crusting. At times, there is problem of the, uh, the breathing or sinechiae. However, again, if the plugs are removed early, timely, first. Second, uh, if a lot of dissection is not done within then the complication rates are really low of the local uh, area. Now, uh, I have had a lot of uh, differences with my ENT colleagues as far as the Haddad flap is concerned. Now, at, when the Haddad flap came in, all the ENT guys jumped into it. Small pits, large pits, giant pits, any type of pits, any type of cellar, intracellar, supracellar surgery, they wanted to go in for a dart flap. But soon we pushed in hard that, you know, our bosses have been doing microscopic surgery day in, day out, no dart flap, simple reaching to the ostia, excising the tumor with excellent results. And I must tell you, since the time we have given up this Haddad flap for simple uh, endonasal excisions, not the extended ones. I think our local complications have reduced. So I still vouch for the two hand, uh, sorry, two surgeon forehand technique. The, there are other advantages also, I being in a private practice, it sort of takes away, uh, I, I save on my time, a lot of uh, other activities is being uh, performed by my more competent ENT guy who's, uh, uh, who's been doing this uh, day in and day out. So I'm, I think he is much more trained than me. At least I am talking about myself. So I am pretty happy to you know pass on this burden to him. But this is again my position. Uh, you all can take a call on what you want. The other reason why I feel that uh, the binostral technique is an excellent technique for, or, or in my hands is, I feel much more comfortable going towards the opposite cavernous sinus area from the opposite nostril. So if I want to go to the left cavernous sinus, I'm more comfortable going through the right nostril and, uh, and uh, you know, vice versa. So... This is uh, another uh, important reason why I have stuck to the 
uh, by nostril technique. Now coming to the position, uh, how I would position the patient. Again, if you look at the CT or MRI, and if you do 3D reconstruction, uh, the, the few conclusions I've come is again, the head needs to be elevated a bit, little bit of extension, some support beneath the shoulders and the head to be tilted, you know, the head to be tilted. So the head gets tilted and so that when you are standing like this, so if the table is like this, the head needs to be like this. So you, all your instruments are, you know, going direct and you don't need to, if the head is straight, if the head is straight, then you need to lean on the table and approach. Whereas if you sort of, how do I show you? Yeah, if you just tilt it, you can go direct in. So some tilting uh, has helped me and I've started uh, fixing the <coughs> patient on uh, the Mayfield or the Sugita. So this is my take on the positioning. Uh, in almost all my cases, I also keep the thigh ready. Now, as far as uh, cellar opening is concerned, there is no doubt you need really wide, wide, wide cellar opening. So wide cellar opening, you know, almost you should feel that you are touching the cavernous sinus. If you are not doing that, and when I meet, when I, when I talk of cavernous sinus, both the cavernous sinuses on the side, and the anterior and the posterior intercavernous sinus. If the tumor is going too anterior or going too posterior, then a bit of the tuberculum as well. I don't want you to open the anterior intercavernous sinus, but the bone drilling needs to be wide. So the bone drilling needs to be really wide. So sphenoid ostia to sphenoid ostia, as far as the sphenoid sinus is concerned, the whole of the uh, lower part of the, uh, sorry, upper part of the clivus needs to be seen, needs to be flattened. Again, going superiorly, the anterior intercavernous sinus needs to be visualized. So that is important. Now, how do we see the endoscopic uh, view of the sphenoid sinus? So here you have the septum. This is the cella. I, I need to see the clivus. Again, this is the internal carotid artery here. So you will see a prominence. Then you have the lateral opticocarotid recess, the medial opticocarotid recess. Then you will have the intercavernous, uh, anterior intercavernous sinus here, the posterior intercavernous sinus here. So just opening the cella, I'm talking of giant tumors. Uh, so open the cella. Now, if you have the cav internal carotid artery here, I, I would push you hard to, you know, sort of go up to here. And that is where, you know, again, go up to here. You can see the carotid bulge here. So go laterally, laterally. And again, superior and inferior. And when I say inferior, you need to flatten this, flatten this part. That will help the tumor fall. And also, it will give you a straighter trajectory towards the deep and posterior part of the tumor. So that is very helpful. However, there are certain caveats to it. Uh, this is another uh, just aspect. So you go from cavernous sinus to cavernous sinus. That is important. But there is a very important part to remember. And that is the Carotid arteries are a little lateral superiorly towards the optic nerves. They are a little lateral. If you, if, if you, if you just recall that when we are doing uh, intracerebral surgery or the sylvian fissure dissection, you see that the carotids are medial. Uh, sorry, the optics are medial and then you have the carotids. So the carotids are pushed lateral as we go towards the optic here. However, they come very near towards the clivus. So when you're drilling the clivus, you need to be cautious. Don't go too lateral, otherwise you can damage the carotids here also. So this is a very important take-home message. 
Also, there is something known as kissing carotids or kissing clavicle carotids where this carotid can really come up to here. So please study your radiology preoperatively so that you're very sure where your carotids are and you do not want to injure. So uh, this was about my take on the exposure. Your exposure should be really wide. And uh, uh, another aspect I think I've already shared, and that is why the anterior intercavernous sinus dura needs to be, the bone on top of it needs to be exposed. Again, the advantage is you can, you know, use your suction as a sort of a retractor. As you push that up, you get a different trajectory and angle to sort of remove more of the tumor under. So when you're using a 30 or a 45 degree and you use your suction to lift that, you will get extra, you can, you know, the residual would be less. So that was the reason why I would want you to, you know, try and drill uh, uh, the bone towards the anterior intercavernous sinus as well. Now, before you see this video, I would explain. So I have exposed the cella here. Here is the cavernous sinus. You will listen to the Doppler. You would also see the pulsations of the carotid. So that is the amount of lateral dissection I try to achieve when I am doing uh, these particular. Again, in this part, you can see the waveforms. Okay, this is another video. Just showing the. Sorry. This is another video just showing the opposite side. I just have to remark, Ashish, that is not a sound effect. I'm sorry? That is not a sound effect. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> so here, if, if you all would have appreciated, the carotid is going more lateral as we are moving towards the optic. So I could not hear the carotids here. However, you know, when the Doppler is kept a little lower, you can hear the carotid. Okay. And not only do I use the Doppler prior to opening the dura, but after I have done the excision, again, I bring that to use. And, you know, to see that I have, there is no... Uh, tumor, significant tumor, I would say, left between uh, uh, between my carotid and uh, the Doppler and the carotid. Though it is not a very cool technique. This was, uh, again, the, the Dopplers on both the sides. Uh, in giant tumors, I've already discussed with this, uh, this part, uh, drill and expose the tuberculum. Dura needs to be exposed so that it can be pushed and inferiorly clival drilling helps excise and you get a good tumor trajectory. Uh, before I end this today's first part, I'll again, uh, Share one small case, a 45-year-old gentleman presenting with progressively moderate frontal headache, severe visual decline, 
the sag mri shows uh, adenoma now look at the size the, it has eroded the complete uh, cella it is reaching right to the sphenoid reaching superiorly part of the planum and tuberculum is eroded and third ventricle and pushing the third ventricular area here and posteriorly almost <coughs> upper two third of the clivus has been eroded so uh, this was the extent here on coronal films again but what i would want uh, you to focus on is that towards the temporal area here that means towards the clival uh, carotid area the tumor has really gone lateral so i was pretty worried here and uh, because that's very near and you know for that i would have required to go much more and i was not prepared pre operatively so so inferior again inferior and lateral so this is the lowest part of the temporal here and the tumor is gone inferior and lateral to the uh, clavicular carotids here sort of pushing now in here again you see that the whole of clavicular is eroded and it is gone into the prepontine cistern though generally as what uh, professor goel keeps on harping and uh, he is now a sort of a broken record that you know the dura is the mother it's not gonna the tumor is not going to in most of the cases it will not until unless it is highly extensively invasive so there would be some dura there is the bacillar here bacillar here and the tumor has reached and this is what we could achieve a complete excision same principles whole tumor coming down and here as well if you could see that you know the whole tumor has been excised now the important thing is this tumor has been left here this is again that part of the tumor which was towards the basi temporal which had gone beyond the carotids and was kissing more towards the uh, clavicular part and the lower part of the carotids so i have finished uh, the this uh, first part today uh, we have another learned speaker today and i would not try to you know barge into his time the in my hopefully john would give us another uh, opportunity in second part and in which i would deal with the technique of dural opening the technique i have already discussed the basic but the technique of excision of tumor the types of scopes the types of instruments that need to be used wherein uh, how your ent and yourself uh, you can plan a reconstruction deal with the csf leak and uh, the smaller nitty gritties of uh, this uh, difficult uh, group of uh, tumors so many thanks for the patient hearing and uh, i hope we meet in the next session thank you so much go ahead adesh yeah so that was a wonderful talk by dr ashish i think uh, Uh, the second part is going to be even more interesting when we see his uh, fine skills uh, to dissect out such tumors just i would like to take a pause uh, john and uh, uh, dr ashish is uh, our next speaker there uh, dr uh, and uh, adesh he was calling me up uh, so if we could check he yeah. was first calling okay. me up when i was presenting i must okay. I, i'm sure he must be in I don't Let see me. him here yet. Dubey, uh, Dubey, Dubey. I'll I'll just call him. Just hold on. Yes. Yeah, okay. Because otherwise, I've got a, a plethora of questions and discussions already ready for you, Doctor Ajit. Yeah. While we're contacting Doctor Dubey, uh, if anybody has a comment uh, for a dish or a question, or just wants to introduce themselves. The floor is open. So, uh, if no uh, one has any uh, comments, 
okay he is coming uh, adish you have uh, dubey sir's number yes i think so can yep. you just forward him the link okay uh i am also trying to do it Okay, Harsha. While we're waiting, you want to, do you have a comment or question? Yeah, John. Yeah, yeah. Hi, Ashish. So very good evening. Good evening. Good evening. How are you? Good. I'm absolutely fine, sir. Thank you. Good. Good to hear you again. Thank wonderful, you. wonderful tips you have given. A uh, few things I would like to share my experience and uh, say. See, if, uh, I I agree with you. The study of uh, MRI, we have to do very, very carefully when we are doing this pituitaries, especially the larger pituitaries and so-called supracellular. And uh, second thing, once we have established that, you said about the lumbar drains. I do use in many, many patients, and it really works in two, three ways. One, by accidentally, if I have opened the uh, arachnoid then post operatively it helps me second thing sometimes you know reverse things you know once we inject little bit of air inside and we can let the tumor fall down it does help to relax it and and and, and i have no no uh, hesitation in using it uh, especially when we have opened uh, regarding the position i agree with you the position is to be slightly tilted i am not able to use the head in a fixed position because i feel that many a times you need to move the head to get into the corners although you may be using 30 degree or 90 degree scopes but still it happens and uh, agreed we have to drill as much as i am very scared to go to the carotid to drill i leave bit a part we just sort of carotid we expose and we use i i don't have a doppler directly but i use the navigation to see where is the carotid and we do and it really works very well you have to have a wider opening of the cella that is very important and believe me four hand techniques really works wonderful if you are you know one person holding then you know scope and through the same nostril you are going through your instruments are hitting each other you know it, it really makes uh, life difficult for a surgeon you are struggling and as we know the person who is hold, holding the scope needs to move the scope as we are removing the tumor whether to go in further or go or come out so it is better to have a second nostril through which you can put your suction and through one you can put your curates or a biopsy forceps it does work so these are the certain points we have found and uh, uh, i'm i'm little reluctant to go beyond the carotids to maybe my Sir, experience uh, uh, to... Uh, uh, now that you have raised this uh, important uh, topic if uh, uh, i i would not want uh, the audience to uh, sort of uh, make this wrong impression i do not drill over the carotids okay so once i have opened up i use either kerosene yeah. or now i have started <laughs> using uh, ultrasonic bone knife oh, so wonderful. i find that much more safer and i use both i use the claw as well as the penar which uh, uh, professor spetzler has designed so i uh, i use these set of instruments when i am very near to the carotids but i do not uh, uh, drill so i would like to stand corrected if i have made that uh, comment uh, i do not drill near the carotid under any circumstances so that is to uh, clarify the first thing as far as the positioning is concerned once i have uh, uh, fixed the patient on the may field uh, uh, i keep uh, side supports sir so uh, i am able to just tilt the table if i need to see okay. the angles so that is how i uh, yeah. sort of circumvent this problem yeah yeah and uh, about the drilling of the clivus i am still not very sure whether it it gives an additional in fact superiorly if i go more further maybe tuberculum it helps me more to expose the this thing but yes what you have said we have to expose the cella widely 
then only you will be able to cut the dura in a fashion you want whether you do a semi circular or whether you do a cross whatever you want to do then only otherwise it becomes very difficult to reach to the corners on the left or right side or you go to 10 o'clock or 1 o'clock so that that is very very important thing and by nostril is a very very important thing very helpful according to me you know you so, can leave your these things hadas flap we use sometimes and sometimes we don't use and it doesn't make any difference that is also we have found and uh, for foreign techniques says patient never complains of any nasal problem afterwards i had little problem recently about a week ago i was doing one pituitary which was large and when we just uh, opened the cella and on the lateral corner probably it started bleeding from the cavernous sinus or maybe into cavernous sinus and i had a tough time to control that and uh, then the of course the flow seal has helped me to reduce the bleeding and stop that bleeding at time i felt oh i may not be able to do the tumor it was so much oozing there so sometimes abnormal large venous channels you come across there one more case another good tip you have given is the carotid artery coming into the cella they are literally herniating it towards the cella may not be kissing but this has to be very carefully thought of before you open the cella the whether the carotid should not come into your way and otherwise you will puncture the carotid artery this is i have i have observed and i experienced also it can be very very dangerous okay. and if the carotid comes and Sorry. very easily people say you can mobilize the carotid but it becomes very difficult to mobilize the carotid in that area because the area is very small you have hardly any room to maneuver sir i think well, we have to be oh, with us now yes dr yes, dubey is here yeah yeah so great great we can take uh, probably further comments later on uh, i would uh, now um, request uh, dr dubey um john if i may share the screen sure you the next speaker sure so uh, the next speaker for the day is uh, dr sudhir dubey uh, who is the chairman and head of the minimally invasive uh, neurosurgery unit at medanta institute of neuro uh, sciences uh, back there in india so uh, the sir is a renowned mis surgeon he has done some ground breaking work in endoscopic minimally invasive surgery and uh, is the executive editor of the journal of craniofacial surgery uh, he is the executive member of the wfns skull base committee in fact he was the recipient of the prestigious young neurosurgeon award which was conferred to him by wfns he is an alumni of the national institute of mental health and neurosciences uh, nimhans and uh, a founder member of the minimally invasive uh, spine society of india in fact he also did his fellowship uh, in endoscopic uh, skull base surgery from upmc pittsburgh so uh, sir uh, uh, he has been a teacher to me as well and uh, apart from being an excellent a very fine surgeon he is a good academician he uh, he's a he's a very good teacher and we uh, always enjoy all the teaching sessions which we have been lucky to have with him so over to you uh, sir hope to have uh, a good time with you again uh, welcome sir okay uh... i will start sharing my screen now so today i am going to talk about minimally invasive surgery for the thoracic disc now thoracic spine is one of the important area it's a no man's land in spine and uh, it is a difficult area to approach as well as to give consistent result one of the most commonest surgery initially to start with is a disc surgery which people encounter and there are a lot of anatomical challenges which people face when they do this kind of a surgery now the most important the center of the universe of a thoracic spine is a thoracic cord we all know that the thoracic spinal canal is the shortest canal uh, diameter or cross sectional area present in whole of the spine 
and it has the most precarious blood supply which is possible. So this makes the pathology also more difficult and they become more symptomatic faster. And it also leads to being a territory where a small amount of error can cause disastrous results for the surgeon and the patients. Now, if you look at a thoracic disc, which is of topic of interest for all of us, the thoracic disc is less than 1% of all the discs, the most common being lumbar, followed by cervical spine disc, followed by thoracic disc. And out of this, only less than 1% people will further require an operation. So symptomatic disc surgery, if we are doing 1,000, one will, one or two may be a thoracic disc surgeries. The involved levels has varied in different people, but it's in most of the cases, it's in the lower thoracic spine, T1011 and T910 being the most common, followed by T8 and 9. The peak incidence is in the fourth decade for these disorders. The thoracic disc as such carries a big challenge because conventional how you can deal with the anterior spine or the lumbar spine. It is the same kind of procedures if you do for uh, lumbar, for thoracic spine will lead to catastrophic results. And a lot of techniques have been modulated, especially in the last 30 years, which have make it more safe for the patients. All these approaches have tried to make this a safe surgery for the patient, which is the most important thing. The approaches are various. They can be thoracotomies, uh, which is from T23 level disc to around T1011 disc. Thoraco abdominal approach, which is a lateral approach. It is at the lower part of the disc. And then transpedicular and extra cavitatory approaches, which have been described and refined in the past 30 years. Initially, thoracic spine surgery was done for uh, these discs in form of laminectomy. And when they saw the surgical outcomes in terms of mortality and morbidity, the results were quite abysmal. So they there was a need to reach more anterior or anterolateral corridors. And for the first time, these corridors by thoracotomy for spine were described in tuberculosis spine. And then a lot of other approaches have been described and they have helped in improving the results and outcome for thoracic disc diseases. So approach, normal posterior approach for thoracic disc is not a good idea. So there are, this is a transpedicular extra foraminal lateral approach and then anterior approaches for thoracic spine, which have been described. And uh, we have to always know that thoracic spinal cord is most susceptible to uh, injuries, whether because of surgical procedures or because of various things. So we are always have to give credits and give a kind of respect to thoracic spinal cord whenever we do our surgery. These are some papers from the past where we have seen that the Morbidity rates were between 18 to 75 percent for thoracic disc surgery, and mortality are 50 percent. So these are uh, old surgeries when the refinement, instrumentation, all these technological advances were not not there. And the most important cause was manipulation of the cord with a precarious blood supply, which lead to this kind of a problem. And also biomechanically, because the spinal canal is very narrow canal, a slight biomechanical change in form of more gibbous kyphosis will lead to further detriment for the patients. So these are all the papers where you can see that mortality increased. And when you went to different approaches, the mortality reduced and uh, the outcomes became better. So, uh, as far as, as soon as in uh, 1998, it was still ambiguous which approach is the best approach to follow because even thoracotomies were 
associated with some mor morbidities and a slight amount of mortality but there has been uh, there has been a new flavor or new favor to minimally invasive approaches because what you do is you select a corridor so as you can see there are dilated tubes and that can be your corridor and in this corridor you can circumvent the spinal canal and the dura and the spinal cord it is minimally disruptive and you only disrupt the anterior and the middle column and that also partially as i will show in my subsequent cases and you are also preserving the posterior tension band because a lot of laminectomy in the uh, in the posteriorly will lead to more of kyphosis getting uh, to the patient which will lead to more neck and back pains so the mis approaches which are used uh, in our center for the thoracic spines can be just a hemilaminectomy where you just take a part of lamina this is not for a thoracic disc then you can do a transforaminal approach where you drill out the facet and the pedicle and then approach this thing extra foraminal where you are not disrupting any bony elements you are going between the ribs directly to the foramen and taking out the disc fragment from there tailored extra foraminal approach to spinal canal tailoring you mean that you do more of bone work and remove more of bone structures so that you are more safe and you do a proper job and then you can have a transthoracic retropleural approach where you don't open the pleura and then you have approaches where you can go through the pleura a vats approach can be done so there there are multiple approaches which can be then upper part of the cervical of the thoracic spine is approached through a open trap door manubriotomy without doing a extensive a sternal opening so these are all the approaches the steps for most of these minimally invasive approach are from posterior so you have to separate the skin you have to position the patient who is position prone you have to uh, identify which structure we have to go which corridor we have to expand that decision is made on the preoperative imaging of the patient and then once you reach a disc space you go inside and take out the disc and then you try to see the canal the most important thing is to see the canal in the last before after decompression if you see the canal before then you are going to retract the dura more and you will cause uh, the injury to the cord there the position of the patient is prone you have a radial lucent frame as we use in our cases routinely and if we are doing a thoracic this thing we will always fold the hands up and take it forwards and up so it doesn't uh, interfere with your imaging techniques we navigate we'll plan our incisions according to which level the disc is there how we have to address a uh, more approach like this will lead you to this a straighter approach will lead you to the disc so looking at the pre operative imaging you have to plan it the skin incision will go through the fat the facial separation is done whether we have to go more laterally then we have to do a horizontal facial incision or if we are not interested in going that much laterally a vertical facial incision is done and muscles are separated with the first dilator and the dilate dilatation continued so you don't really don't burn you make a tissue plane between the muscles and put your plant your port inside so that is the most important step and this and uh, this the initial thing is the most important thing so you should be doubly confirmed yourself with a c arm or o arm or with navigation wherever you are going because if your trajectory is like if you are like in this case if you are an angle then you will always have a problem in dealing with disc at this place so you should always be perpendicular depending on whatever the pathology if disc is extruded going on the upper side more your port should be slightly more upper if it is disc is going down more then it should be more down so perpendicular and down is the most important thing when you do this surgery 
Incision once you have planned, you have to dilate. As I told you, the facial skin inc facial incision has to be determined which uh, how much lateral you have to go. If you have to go very lateral, then it has to be a transverse incision, a horizontal one. And if you don't have to go too much lateral, it can be a vertical incision which has to be there. Now, once you localize, in this case, we are using a, a navigation. So we will determine our trajectory. So from skin to down this space, we have determined the trajectory. In this case, if we want to disrupt there, then we know how much bone work and bone resection, which we have to do. And we will co corroborate this with when we are doing interoperatively and we are finding out what exactly we are doing. Once we have reached there, the bony opening, we will always be guided according to what we see there. Uh, I'm now doing all these cases with navigation guidance, but previously I used to do with CRM guidance. So in that case, your AP and uh, lateral views are the most important and you should have a three-dimensional structure of which bone you will find where and how you will disrupt. And you have to take a frequent shots in AP and lateral view so that you don't go into the spinal canal. Spinal canal entering in the last is the most important step when you are doing this. And that forms your safe passage. So this is another case where I'm showing navigation for reaching the body. So I'm reach the body, I'm reach it laterally. So you should exactly know where exactly where you have to go. And you have to be safe in the spinal canal. That is the most important thing when you are doing this kind of a surgery that you don't go into the spinal canal and initially you reach the disc space and you have to see the dura. You have to take a angled cranial endoscope 30 degree and go inside and see all of the dura so that if you have removed the disc, you are pretty sure that the disc has got removed and there are no surprises in post-operative time. Uh, the MIS approaches, as I told you, the most important is transforaminal, extraforaminal, and tailored extra foraminal approach, which I will be talking about in now my next subsequent slide. The decision to do which kind of approach depends on nature of disc. So if it's a soft lateral disc, an extra foraminal approach will take care of it. You don't really have to disrupt any of the bony cor corridors. If it's a hard or soft, but it is going into the central part, then you can you have to tailor how much bone opening you have to do. And uh, a large central disc also, you have to do a transforaminal approach because you can see the dural tube on the side and then you remove the, uh, the disc. But if it's a hard calcified central disc, you have to be more ventral. Your approach has to be more lateral. And then you will do an extensive resection, uh, extra approach for this. The approach corridor for transforaminal approach is a corridor which will go through a port and we will go into the disc space. We have to disrupt a part of the pedicle, part of the facet joints which is there. And we will protect the spinal canal with the dura and the spinal cord inside. So, and if it's an extraforaminal approach, we will do the same thing. We won't go anywhere, but we will go between the two, uh, on the lateral part of the facet, between the two ribs and go directly to the disc space. So this is the approach which is, which will be the extra foraminal approach without bony disruption. This is what you will see the foraminal anatomy inside. And this is what the navigation which will tell you, it's not going, but it's going between the bones where structures are preserved. So this is an operative video. So what I have done is I've gone through this port inside and this is the foraminal area. So I'm dissecting that area. I'm feeling with the dissector, which I felt through a, a hook that there was a foramen. And this is the disc which I have seen. So I've removed the disc gradually. Now you have seen, you start to see, begin to see the dura here now. And then you remove the disc. So gradually you remove the disc. And then you can see the pulsations of the dural tube. And in this, you have not disrupted any of the structures. So the most important thing is that you dissect the foraminal area. Intercostal artery and nerve has to be washed for. You can even 
coagulate and cut. You identify the foramen, cut the disc open. This is the disc being done once. Because it's a large disc, when you decompress it, you will start seeing the dura. You may take a part of the, there will be a pedicle which is here. You can sometimes drill that, but sometimes you can get away without that. So this is what you can see the dural tube in this case, once you have done an extra foraminal approach. And this is what I was telling about, you use different endoscopes. So in this case, I put an endoscope and there is still a part of this fragment which is inside, which I am teasing with a downward angle curette so that there is no pressure which is left. This was a hard disc. So I have to push gradually. They had to drill it also because there was some calcification. So I've drilled it below the dural tube here. And it's all through an endoscope here now. Because until you push this, you won't lead to neurological recovery. Because as you know, Many of these patients will have a, a neurological weakness in form of foot drop or foot weakness, which is very significant. And until you remove these fragments and the dura becomes totally lax, you will be struck in this, uh, when you will be struck with some neurology and the improvement won't be total. The other corridor is for tailored extrafuraminal approach to spinal canal. In this, we have to take out the facet joint, a part of the pedicle and part of the rib head, which is present here. So in this approach, what we do is, we will keep our port, our direction is like this, and then we will go and drill our area. First, we will, what we will do is, we will separate on the rib through our port, all the muscles which are present in the posterior musculature of the thoracic cage. And then we will proceed with the surgery. So this is something what we do. And then we will drill these bones and we will reach in an area which is ventral. And we will always make a rim to be, to be saved till the end. So that is very important. So in this case, I will show you the stepwise. We have gone. We have put the ports. Sequentially, we have put the ports and we have got inside. Now, once we have got inside, here, these are the lateral part of the facet joint, which are there. Whatever the muscles are there, you will separate it out. You will reach from lateral to medial. And this is the uh, intercostal space medially or the lateral part of the foramen, for if you look from the sides. This is the area you have reached. This is the area of the foramen. Gradually, you make it more and more open. You burr it out. And you can see that gradually we are seeing more and more this area, the foramen becoming more wider. We can peep into the dural tube here. There's a, some epidural blood vessels which are there. And we gradually make more spores. This is the area of the pedicle which is there. And we will take out this part of the disc which is there. Now, our aim is to expand this foramen area. And this is the dural tube with the epidural vessels. You can see that white thing peeping up. Gradually, we are making more space. And this is, you are seeing from lateral. You are at around uh, 50 to 60 degree coming from the lateral to the medial sides. So, gradually, you make this lateral area. This will be the root which will be coming out through the intercostal uh, into the intercostal space from here. And gradually when you tease out, you will start taking out the disc. So dura becomes more and more defined. And it's a root now that the major tube will, some, will lie somewhere here. So gradually you take out the disc. And then this, you have done a slight tailored approach and taken out the disc fragment. So in this, when you are doing this, you will always have a hook which is there, which will tell you how much superior and inferior you have to go. So a lot of ligamentous structures will be there, which you have to separate from the dural tube so that they don't cause any pressure to the patient uh, later on on the dural tube and having less recovery symptomatically.
now once your exposure becomes more this you have to be more careful because here you can cause this is a harder part of the disc so you have to take bites you you take again cranial endoscope and then you take the bite for this and clear the dural tube so this is a tailored approach for this in some cases you will also have to go and take out a part of the rib where you have to go more laterally this is a foraminal approach again where we are taking out this is a this was a case of a tumor this was not exactly a disc but this was a foraminal approach where we just removed the facet and this was a hemangioma so we were able to deliver that out so this is what it looked like in this extra foraminal approach which we used for this hemangioma the next is a transthoracic retropleural approach which is more disruptive and you require it for more extensive lesion which are going above and below so in this you have to remove the part of the rib head also along with the rib 5 cm this are all is done through a port so what you are seeing is we are removing the rib first and then we are going from lateral to medial and then we are expanding the foramen and we do a part of the discectomy first so we have a space in front of the dural tube so this is the disc which we are taken out but the pressure thing we will use a curette downward angle and we will just slide the last fragments of the bone down so it gives you a uh, enough corridor so that you can have a safe uh, passage a uh, open trap door maneuverability is for the d1 d2 d2 d3 discs in this you really don't have to do a median sternotomy you do a approach in which you go along the sternocleidomastoid give a median incision like this and you do a opening like this and then you do till a uh, sternal angle you do a maneuverability and take the curd towards the lateral side and then you put a intercostal spreader to the retractor there so you will see the upper part of the great vessels but you won't see the pericardium or those structures down what you have to do is then you have to loop the brachiocephalic vessels along so that you have a retraction and you have a corridor between the uh, between the uh, carotid arteries subclavians and the carotid arteries which you will have a enough uh, uh, this thing and you will have a window to be to reach that area so this is how you this is the approach which is used and this is the loops on the vessels innominate vessels and this is the approach is similar to anterior cervical approach but it gives you a inferior axis so this is the approach which is there in concluding the minimally invasive it is the minimally invasive approach is the approach of choice for disc it is minimally invasive to the surrounding tissues but it makes us address the disc very properly it is safe it is effective and we have done around 33 cases over past 18 years with these minimally invasive approaches the important thing is one of the most common mistake is doing a wrong level surgery and we have done in two such cases in which in post op mri we had not reached the correct level so we had to do those two cases again but that was when we were more dependent on fluoroscopy than on oam with the navigation that has become more more uh, better and uh, done properly this is very satisfying surgery but if done improperly this can lead to catastrophe in the terms of neurological morbidities and inability of patient to walk in the post operative period in one of my patients though the patient had nearly zero power in the lower limbs patient in around 6 months to 1 year time after doing the surgery was able to walk and it was a hardened calcified disc 
So it is a very gratifying surgery over the long term and it gives us good results if you take care of the dural tube and if you take care of the, that you don't retract the cord enough. So with this, I will conclude my talk and then I'm open to any questions which are there. Thank you, sir, for that uh, wonderful enlightening talk. Um, in fact, it is a very dreaded zone for all the neurosurgeons alike uh, venturing into the thoracic uh, spinal cord, and especially for a pathology which is anteriorly placed uh, the likes of a disc and that being addressed posteriorly by the conventional approach does uh, pose a significant challenge and uh, definitely is associated with a lot of uh, morbidity. Uh, so, uh, with the, this technique which you have shown, uh, of course, not many of us are able to do <clears throat> those things as of now, but definitely it gives us a, 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 a perspective into what all is uh, uh, being done and can be done to give better outcomes. So, thank you, sir, for that wonderful, enlightening uh, and encouraging talk. I would request uh, uh, any of the uh, our uh, viewers, if they have any questions, to please uh, ask, sir. So I think uh, there are none at present. So, uh, uh, John, um, should we move ahead? John, you are unmuted. You are not muted. You cannot hear. Oh, you. oh I'm sorry. Uh, Ashish, are you there? Yes. Yeah, do you want to comment, please? Oh well. Um, uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank uh, Dr. Dubey. He's doing some marvelous work and he's a big ambassador of Indian neurosurgery. And I must tell you that uh, today is like uh, MP area, Adesh, Sudhir, sir, myself, we all belong to the same central, uh, we all come from rather the same central zone. And uh, sir, thank you for uh, joining us uh, at such a short notice on this forum. And we appreciate and uh, we would uh, love to have you more often uh, on this platform and share your experience. Okay. Fine. It was nice that we had participated, but it's different time zones, I think. But it's a lot of presence of people. And I think whatever I shared my experiences and it's helpful to all the other people also. Absolutely, sir. It would be. <laughs> Uh, Adesh, you want to take it uh, any further or if there are any questions to both of us, uh, we can uh, take. Uh, yeah, I've been, I've been uh, asking our uh, viewers if they have any questions, they can please go ahead and mute yourself and ask. Let's, uh, let's see here. Takashi, are you there? Takashi, you still there? Takashi's a neurosurgeon from Japan. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, uh, everyone. So, uh, very informative lecture. So, um, I'm not familiar with endoscopic surgery, but um, I'm a uh, um, very informative lecture, and I studied a lot. I learned a lot about uh, anatomy and surgical uh, procedure. Thank you. Uh, I keep learning, uh, attending. Thank you. Thank you, Takashi. Welcome. So, um, okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. So, Dr. Ashish, I would like to further take up uh, that discussion which we were having on your endoscopic pituitary approach. So, I, um, as Dr. Parikh said, as you said, that uh, the kind of uh, approach that you uh, have been practicing, in my uh, short experience, what I have learned, uh, the place where I'm working, I uh, am not fortunate enough to have an ENT surgeon always to assist me. One thing. The second thing uh, which I have been uh, uh, facing is a lack of uh, a navigation as of now or of Doppler. So I have sort of uh, uh, kind of uh, made a niche, uh, 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 made myself comfortable with a single surgeon and a uninostral approach. 
and uh, uh, i think uh, most of our tumors are completely uh, uh, re getting removed uh, completely we are achieving gross total resection with a single nostril and a single uh, surgeon approach so uh, coming to uh, that point by point uh, what i have found that especially when we talk of pituitary adenomas they are very friable tumors they do not require to be cut or to be pulled just our uh, this um, uh, the uh, curate curate is enough uh, a, a movement of the curate through the uh, uh, the uh, flesh of the tumor is enough to disrupt it so what i have been practicing is just uh, uh, scoop a few uh, strokes of curate and uh, then take it out put in a suction with one hand i hold my camera and with the other hand uh, alternating curate suction curate suction curate suction and that gives uh, i think uh, over time i have uh, uh develop that speed that i'm able to complete the case in uh, that period of time uh, with good um, uh, even without an assistant it's a two hand technique the scrub assistant that is the uh, nursing assistant which i have they usually i uh, ask them to just keep the saline uh, uh, a warm saline nozzle on the uh, just inside the nostril so in between they'll keep pushing 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 and i'll keep taking out the tumor one thing the second thing as I, all of us agreed during the lecture as well uh, the need for the hadad flap in fact uh, when hadad flap came you all were excited and everybody was doing it now it's just a simple linear mucosal incision you elevate the flap you go inside and uh, do it hadad flap i think we only do it for only for clival chordomas now where there is extensive dissection there is a lot of uh, um, uh, almost all of the csf comes out through uh, the Uh, arachnoid and the dural opening that uh, we have made in the uh, clival region so in those cases only after making a proper cartilage or a, bo a bony base and over that we uh, place a hadad flap otherwise we usually do not uh, prefer that coming to again uh, the idea of using lumbar drains uh, we were initially using lumbar drains but over last i think 4 uh, or 5 years we have stopped using lumbar drains all together even if we have a small leak i saw one of your videos dr ashish you had very nicely shown where how nicely a small rent in the arachnoid you had plugged with a, a gentle push of the uh, uh, fibrin glue and that i think is excellent we usually either push in a, a bit of uh, fibrin glue or uh, just a plug of um, uh, this thing or the fat which we take uh, usually a peri umbilical fat we take we put in a, a, a plug of fat we were initially in our initial experience we were also using some amount of uh, trying to use a muscle bit but we have realized that muscle uh, does not help because they usually necrose whereas fat globules they cicatrize they stay there they don't vanish muscle usually vanishes so fat i think is the best alternative for that and uh, as far as reconstruction and closure is concerned so uh, you beautifully showed how a, a wide Uh, bony excision has to be done what i have realized that uh, other than the wide bony excision on both sides uh, the more important uh, uh, bone removal is not the superior not towards the tuberculum uh, cella it is more towards the down the clivus bone shan i would like to just uh, share a screen and um, so this is the uh, part if you uh, can see so this the blue uh, star this here this bone needs to be drilled uh, what we have uh, realized over time that because this is the bone which hits this part of the curate the angle of the curate if uh, uh, dr ashish can correlate uh, other speakers can correlate so in, and the entry of your curate especially the longer angled curates where you want to take out tumor uh, from the sides or the posterior most uh, near the clival uh, part of the tumor so uh, this part of the bone needs to be drilled out very well so that uh, one can uh, insert the angled suctions and angled curates easily otherwise they keep hitting the bone over here the instruments keep hitting the bone and it's very irritating the superior part of the bone even if you have not reached up to the level of the intercavernous sinus i feel the tumor finally falls and you are able to do that so uh, these are i mean uh, the comments which i had Um, over to you ashish uh, sir for your comments yeah i would absolutely agree with most of your uh, uh, suggestions remarks uh, comments 
uh, absolutely well taken and goes on to suggest that uh, there are uh, uh, many ways to skin a cat there is no doubt and uh, you know as uh, men, as even alex perneski used to say you know that you have to do mis as available in your center yes. now suppose if you do not have a ent surgeon it, it's in a way blessing in disguise that you are able to do it on your own so that is commendable and that is very good and that is something to be learned by <clears throat> our uh, uh, other audience uh, so that is absolutely uh, understood and well taken now as far as doppler is concerned i would strongly push you to get a doppler it is one of the cheapest technologies you can get yeah. extremely cheap and uh, it does help you and you know it he- it helps me in one of my fellows just presented if you you were there with us in mpcon and even dubey sir was here and you know it helps us not only in pituitaries it helps us in cvj to see the vertebral artery it uh, helps us i even use it for you know anterior cervical uh, when i am opening the pll i just put it there i know where the epidural veins are so in wow. that area you know i am not going to open the and the the pll so i try to it's a beautiful piece of equipment it's something special that you can have very cheap and i would strongly suggest you to have it now uh, uh, i i just kept mum when uh, dr parik like dr parik and you have opposing views he went he he said that he has to go up you said you have to go down i would say that we have to go both up and down because <laughs> see if you have now just imagine if you have the cell i hear and the tumor is you know going like this so yeah. it is above the tuberculum mm-hmm. now if you do not uh, push the, if you are able to push the anterior intercavernous it might be a little mm-hmm. easier because the mm-hmm. diaphragm mm-hmm. tends to fall fall yeah fall so that also has its uh, 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 place in uh, uh, giant tumors as far as uh, clavicle drilling is concerned you have already shown it beautifully and i would uh, agree <coughs> and endorse your comment absolutely that it should be done again for me not only the instruments the scissoring is avoided but it also provides me a good trajectory to go down straight yeah. and sort of debulk large tumors so yeah. i would absolutely agree yeah right Uh, how how do you uh, support your closure i mean uh, at the end of it when the procedure is done you have uh, done your reconstruction of the dura you have put in pieces of the nasal septal bone which are there and then you have replaced the flap what next do you just uh, put in uh, so, uh, I, i must tell you uh, i have gone uh, i will show you one of the complications of my ent surgeon uh, i have that in my next presentation okay you know we packed as much as fat as much as the tumor was i i'll show you those pictures so you know i have gone you mean intracellular in, fat yes not only intracellular even supracellular <laughs> okay <laughs> so i have you know those are times when the learning phase of the ent specialist as well so i have gone against reconstruction a lot and this comes again back to the same philosophy as our senior uh, learned uh, professors used to do they hardly did any reconstruction so if i have a mucosa i would lay it i would put some gel foam and uh, you know come out i do not generally and because i am a proponent of the lumbar drain i i just drain some 30 40 ml of csf every 8 hours and i am not bothered that you know there would be a lot of post op csf leak so i am not a very big fan of reconstruction okay uh, the reconstruction which we uh, try to do is uh, mainly when we have already taken off the cellular floor especially uh, larger tumors we try to put in a piece of the septal bone just over there so that uh, the pulsations of the csf do not push the mucosa and uh, just to prevent uh, any further csf leak just a piece of the septal bone as a support and over that we place the uh, mucosa i agree there are there, there is a school of thought doing this absolutely 
Okay. I think we have Dr. Rakesh Gupta, uh, Professor and Head of Neurosurgery from uh, uh, Indore. He, he's there. Uh, sir, are you, can you listen to us, sir? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, so please go ahead, sir. Welcome. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Ashish, for a very nice uh, lectures and uh, nice videos. And I'm particularly happy, as you have mentioned, that uh, we have learned a lot about from our teachers at All India Institute. And uh, they were hardly doing much of reconstruction. Uh, in my initial uh, phase of my practice, I experienced twice uh, the occurrence of pneumocephalus after I put a lumbar drainage. So, uh, what is your experience about that? Because after that, I stopped putting lumbar drain. Now, you would have pneumocephalus only if your arachnoid has been opened. Am I correct? Yeah, that was after CSF leak only. Yeah. So, sir, uh, you know, there are, uh, uh, for me, uh, luckily, we have not had uh, too much of this problem. But I think that is uh, because of some special blessing. And uh, may God keep it that way. However... Uh, you know, sir, uh, for, uh, once we are doing it on the lumbar drain, our experience is we push in, uh, we push in uh, saline. And just recently I had operated, I would be sharing that case uh, next in the next part. Huge, super huge tumor, we removed it and we did not refill the CSF, uh, you know, and we had a hematoma, local hematoma. Patient had no problem, only that the visual recovery was a little slower. So, as you have correctly said that, you know, it is, uh, nothing comes for free. Everything has a price to be paid, lumber drain in itself. But at this juncture, uh, I would still, uh, my, uh, I would still put my fortune towards putting in a lumber drain. I mean, you can always switch it off in between the surgery if you want, but you cannot put it in once the surgery has started. Yes. So I'm more comfortable getting that uh, extra thing in before I start the surgery. So the take-home message from your side is, if at all you want to put lumbar drain, put it before the surgery. Yeah. Before no, I started. always put it for giant tumors, sir. I always put it prior, not later. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ash. Thank you, I would like to add to this, sir, uh, Raki, sir, what sir. we practice here is uh, we put lumbar drain only uh, uh, for cases like uh, a craniopharyngioma we are doing transferably or uh, a clival chordoma. And in those cases, the lumbar drain that we put, uh, the, an important thing we realized over time is that the drainage of uh, CSF has to be highly regulated. It should not be more than 8 or maximum 10 ml per hour. So the nursing staff is instructed that every hour open it, let around 8 ml uh, of uh, CSF come and then close it again. So that's how we have been surviving uh, uh, by preventing uh, the development of pneumocephalus or for that matter, development of meningitis. Yeah, that's I would agree. Nice I tip, also... Adesh. That's a very nice tip. Thank you so yeah, much. We, uh, uh, Gupta sir, we also do the same thing, but only that we do it every six to eight hours if we have not had a leak. Okay. So every six hours, we would drain varying between 25, 50, even 60, 70 ml, depending on what the situation is, two to three times a day. That is what we do. And the basic reason is we want just minimal handling of uh, the catheter. So we do not want every hour, you know, some sister touching the, the catheter system. Yeah. So that is the, I, the philosophy behind, you know, making it twice or thrice. Uh, and uh, the other important thing is we do not keep it for more than two, three, four days. Yes. We try to get it out as early as possible. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Do you see any more questions? Uh, no, John. Go ahead. There's nothing in the chat. Okay. Uh, nobody's raising their hands. Over okay. To me, okay, very good. I guess we'll wrap it up. Okay. <clears throat> any plans, uh, uh, for two weeks? We're going to have one in two weeks, correct? Yeah, I would uh, like to finish off mine, uh, my second part. And uh, we, I'll discuss with uh, 
the other surgeons, uh, whoever would be inclined to join, especially for the spine part, I would uh, bring it up to you and inform you. Yes, we also have a neurosurgeon from Iran who wants to present his findings in an MS, MIS uh, surgery uh, trial, re research, they're doing research on MIS. So yeah, it'll be nice to bring in the research part of the field. Sure, 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 John. Okay, so uh, thank you everyone for coming. Thanks for the speakers, thanks for the moderators, thanks for everyone. Uh, Surir, thank you very much. Uh, Ashish, thank you for your presentation and uh, hang around. We're gonna interact with students. The students get to meet the neurosurgeons. So hang around here after I end. I'm gonna go off the air right now. So thank you everybody. Thank you very much, everybody.